welcome back everyone uh, in this lecture uh, we will uh, continue with uh, uh, rep bit more representation theory so first we will actually see uh, this uh, fundamental theorem of isomorphism so the very first isomorphism theorem uh, that you must have seen in other contexts uh, that says that whenever you have a homomorphism between two different uh, g modules so then uh, if we take v modulo the kernel that will become isomorphic to the image so let me state this okay so this is uh, something you must have seen in other contexts like groups rings and uh, vector spaces now we will actually uh, see this in the context of g modules so we take uh, gbl algebra and v and w be g modules okay let's say we have a lie algebra sorry module homomorphism from v to w so this is a g module homomorphism then so this is the given data so then we can actually define uh, what is called kernel so which is naturally defined to be the kernel of this linear map this is those vector in capital v such that which are mapped to zero under this morphism phi the second thing is there is this image so which is defined to be the image of all the vectors which is phi of v v comes from capital v so the thing is the kernel will become g module so this is a g module and indeed it is a g sub module of capital v and this image is a g sub module of capital w so now uh, one can actually construct module structure on the quotient so this v modulo kernel phi so this becomes module for g and then this is will become naturally isomorphic to image of phi so image of phi as a g module uh, uh, we have we know that we have the g action so there is this natural uh, vector space isomorphism that is actually comes from phi induced from phi uh, from v modulo the kernel phi to this image phi so that vector space isomorphism is indeed g module isomorphism okay what is the structure on this kernel uh, sorry the quotient v modulo the kernel phi so that is easy to define so recall that the v modulo the kernel phi is nothing but all possible cosets v plus kernel phi where v comes from capital v okay now we define the action of g that is inherited from the ambient module v so how one can define for x in g and v in capital v so we define x acting on this v plus kernel phi is defined to be just x v plus kernel phi so this is how the action is defined so now it's easy to verify this indeed gives uh, actually well defined action because we are actually going model of the kernel so if you take any two representatives for example we can take uh, v plus some w1 and then v plus some w2 where w1 and w2 both come from the kernel so then it's easy to see that uh, this uh, action actually is going to give us v x of v plus w1 that is going to be x v plus x w1 which is same as x v plus x w2 since kernel phi is indeed a sub module okay so kernel phi is a g sub module 
of capital V. So, this I will leave it as exercise, it is not very difficult to prove. So, that tells you that x w 1 and x w 2 both are element of kernel phi. So, that means x v plus w 1 is going to be equal to x v plus w 2 modulo the kernel. Okay. So, that means even if you take any two representatives, the action of this g action is going to give you same answer. Okay. For example, we can take w 1 to be 0, then we can easily see that x v kernel phi is same as x v plus x w 2 kernel phi. So, the action is well defined. So, now it is a routine uh, thing to check this is indeed a G module. Okay. So, I will leave it as exercise check G acts on this V modulo kernel phi. That means we need to verify that. So, that whenever you take two element x and y from G, then if you look at the bracket x y that acts as x composition y minus y composition x. Of course, uh, that induced action we can denote it by phi tilde, then what we mean by x composition y, phi tilde of x composition phi tilde of y minus phi tilde of y composition phi tilde of x. Okay, that I am going to leave it to you to check. So, now uh, we have a natural map which we are calling it phi tilde, so which is a linear map induced from the linear map phi which is defined from uh, v modulo kernel phi to image of phi. Okay. So, it is easy to check image phi is also uh, g module that is all I am leaving it to you to check. Now, this map is isomorphism as a vector space. Okay. So, this is already bijective correspondence. So, this is uh, linear isomorphism. So, that comes from actually the theory of vector spaces. So, now because we have G module structure on both sides, it is enough to check the phi tilde commutes with the G, G, G action. So, that is again easy to check because that is what happens in phi. Okay. So, let us write it down. So, whenever we have x in G and V in capital V, we have phi tilde of x applied on V plus kernel phi. So, this is something we need to check, this is exactly equal to x of phi tilde of V. Okay. The map is given by V plus kernel phi map to phi of V. So, that is the map. Okay. Again, one can check this is a well defined map, there is no problem. So, now, so what is x v plus kernel phi? x of v plus kernel phi is nothing but x v plus kernel phi. So, then phi tilde of this is going to be same as phi tilde of this. So, which is nothing but phi of x v, but phi of x v is going to be phi of x in x act on phi of v because phi is indeed G model homomorphism. So, that implies that this is same as x of phi tilde of phi. Okay. So, this simple routine check says that phi tilde is indeed is indeed G module homomorphism. So, that means the map that we have defined here is indeed G module isomorphism. Again, one can actually write down all other isomorphism theorem like second isomorphism and third isomorphism theorems and so on. So, I will leave it to you to actually uh, uh, check what it is. So, most important thing uh, that I am going to state now uh, the submodule correspondence that is what important. Suppose you have this map phi uh, which is defined from V to W which is a G module homomorphism. So, then we are interested in understanding the submodules of V uh, containing the kernel and the submodules of W. 
okay. So, let us assume that uh, this map is on to for the simplicity otherwise we can restrict to the image of V. So, now uh, we have the sub modules of V that contains actually uh, kernel phi. So, let us call it V dash. So, this is uh, all sub modules which contains kernel phi. Okay. These are all the G sub modules. So, now uh, from this set there is this uh, natural map that actually uh, takes uh, V dash to phi of V dash. So, then this is actually mapping to let us say W dash which are all G sub modules of W. Okay. So, then you can see that uh, there is this natural map that actually takes V dash to phi of V dash and this map indeed one to one corresponds. Okay. So, the reverse map given by whenever we take W dash then we just simply take phi inverse of W dash and it is easy to check phi inverse of W dash is indeed G sub module. Okay. So, there is this uh, lattice correspondence between the sub modules of V which contains kernel phi and then uh, so G sub modules of W. Okay. So, what I mean by lattice correspondence? So, this is a post set with respect to the containment. So, whenever we take uh, uh, V dash contained in V double dash, you can see that the image will be contained. So, it is actually preserves the partial order. Okay. So, this is indeed a lattice correspondence. Anyway, so this is indeed immediately follows from the fact that we have such correspondence between the vector spaces and whenever we start with the G model, we end up getting G model on the right hand side and uh, whenever we talk uh, start with the G model on the right side, we end up getting G model on the left hand side. So, that tells that uh, this correspondence is there. So, this is something easy to check. So, maybe I will leave it you to check this. So, this is also I will leave it as exercise. Okay. So, now we define uh, what is called reducible modules. So, we already seen some classes of modules. So, we have seen uh, what is called indecomposable modules. And then we have seen what is called irreducible. So, basically first we define what is called reducible modules and then uh, the modules that are not reducible are called irreducible. Okay. So, that way we also define what is called reducible modules. So, we are going to see uh, some interesting modules so which are called completely reducible modules. Okay. So, here is the definition. completely reducible or sometimes it they are called semi simple representations. So, completely reducible modules in the model theory or if you want to use the language of representation they are called semi simple representations. So, what are the completely reducible modules? So, your model V is said to be uh, reducible sorry completely reducible let us say a module of course G module capital V is said to be completely reducible G module if for any given proper sub module W okay, for any given proper G sub module W we have W dash which is again proper 
g sub module. So, that just follows from w being proper anyway, this is proper g sub module such that v can be written as w direct sum w dash. Okay. So, this is indeed sum of uh, actually uh, vector spaces, but anyway, so we are going to define the notion of uh, direct sums. So, once we know what is the uh, direct sum of modules, then indeed it says v is in indeed direct sum of uh, w and w dash. And this is should be true for all uh, proper sub modules G, uh, w in v. So, there are actually many uh, different definitions of complete reducibility available in the literature and one can prove that all those definitions are actually equivalent. So, for example, uh, I am going to actually give prove one of the statement. So, let me just recall. Uh, so, what are all the other analogous statements are there? The very first uh, definition is given in this uh, definition. So, it is said to be completely reducible if for any given proper G sub module you have complement of the W. So, this W dash is called complement of W in capital V. Okay. So, given any proper W, we always have complement that is what uh, it says. So, if V is completely reducible reducible G module. So, then one can prove that V can be written as direct sum of uh, irreducible sub modules. Okay. So, one can prove that V is a direct sum of irreducible G modules. Actually, one can just take it to be sub modules, not a problem. But what one can prove, uh, we can actually have a weaker version of this. So, one can replace direct sum by just a sum okay, and still the statement will be equivalent to complete reducible, completely reducible. So, V is a just a sum of irreducible sub models. So, one can prove that uh, all these statements are equivalent. V being completely reducible G model uh, means V can be written as direct sum of irreducible models. So, that is also equivalent to V is just being sum of irreducible models. So, of course, we are assuming that uh, all of our models are finite dimensional. One can make such statements for uh, any any module. Okay. So, this is actually kind of some general nonsense, but anyway uh, we will do it for the finite dimensional models. Okay. We assume V is finite dimensional modules. Okay. So, what I am going to do? I am going to actually prove that uh, 1 and 2 are equivalent. I will leave it as exercise to prove that uh, 2 and 3 are equivalent. So, it is easy to see that 2 implies 3. So, indeed what one can do, one can prove that 1 implies 2, 2 implies 3 and then 3 implies 1. Okay. One can try to prove in all possible directions. Okay. So, exercise may be try to prove that 3 implies 1 and 3 implies 2. Because uh, uh, 2, uh, 2 implies 3 is obvious and then uh, if you prove 3 implies 1, that way also one can get 3 in plus 2, but anyway one can try to prove straight away 3 in plus 2. So, we are going to prove only 1 if and only if 2. Okay. So, before actually uh, getting into uh, this characterization of completely reducible models, 
So, let us see some examples and then try to understand what we mean by completely reducible. So, uh, so let us actually uh, understand, okay. so if I take uh, this uh, G2, so this is the non-abelian uh, two dimensional uh, Lie algebra. So, this is actually naturally acts on C2 okay, because G2 is realized as uh, 2 by 2 matrices inside JL2. So, now one can actually see that this is indeed reducible G2 representation. Indeed, uh, one can take W to be the span of E1. So, let us say E1 and E2, this is the standard basis of C2. So, then uh, if we take E1 uh, span by E1, which is the W, so this is a proper uh, subspace of C2. Then one can easily see that E11 acts on E1 as just E1 with the eigenvalue 1. Then if you take E12, so which is acting on E1 will be 0, okay, just a simple matrix multiplication. So that tells you that uh, because G2 is span of E11 and E12, which is the non abelian uh, two dimensional algebra. So it says that uh, this subspace span by E1 is indeed submodule. So this is G submodule of C2. Okay. So I will leave it to you to check whether this has complement or not. So the exercise check W has complement in C2 or not. Okay. So basically if C2 is completely reducible or not, you can actually uh, check if for example, W does not have complement, then that will imply immediately that uh, C2 is not completely reducible. Okay, Because by definition of complete reducible, you need to have a complement for all of them. So now, uh, let us see some other examples of uh, representations. So if we take any one dimensional representation, that will be irreducible. Okay. So if we take uh, Cn, which is uh, can be regarded as representation of GLN. Okay, GLN acts on CN. Okay, so maybe I can leave it as exercise. So this is indeed irreducible action. Okay, so this is a natural representation. So prove that CN is irreducible. as GLN representation. So, one can also say that it is indeed irreducible as SLN represent. So, there is SLN naturally acts on this CN. Okay. So, indeed one can make a very strong statement using what is called density theorem. So, if I start with a Lie algebra, let us say G, which is a let us say uh, uh, linear Lie algebra which is sitting inside JLN. So, this is uh, Lie subalgebra. So, then naturally G acts on Cn okay, via the matrix multiplication. So, G acts on Cn naturally via matrix multiplication. So, now the question is when the Cn will become irreducible for G. Okay. One can answer that uh, using the subalgebra, associative subalgebra generated by G. So, what is the statement? One can prove that C n is irreducible G module if and only if when we take this associative subalgebra, associative subalgebra generated by G. So, that is going to be exactly the entire 
n by n set of all n by n matrices m n of c. Okay. The one way is obvious suppose uh, g generate as a associative subalgebra m n of c then c n must be irreducible because uh, any sub module of g will be corresponding to the sub module of m n of c but uh, there are no uh, sub module other than like proper sub module other than c n. The converse part okay. So, when uh, whenever c n is irreducible as a g module so then the subalgebra generated by g it will become irreducible okay so suppose cn is irreducible g module then that implies that cn is irreducible as this subalgebra module so, this is the associative subalgebra generated by G. Now, density theorem tells you that, so this is called density theorem. Density theorem says that this has to be exactly equal to M and C. So, this is one of the applications of density theorem. Okay. So, now uh, you can actually check when uh, C n can be irreducible for some subalgebra G. So, now it is easy exercise to see that uh, S L n actually generates uh, M n of C okay, as a subalgebra, associative subalgebra. Okay. So, now we will actually give one simple characterization uh, for modules being irreducible. Okay. Let us say G being a Lie algebra and uh, V is irreducible G module. Okay. V is irreducible G module. So, then if and only if what one can prove for any non-zero vector V in capital V if we take the sub module generated by this sub module generated by V then that has to be entire V and this should be true for all vector V in capital V non zero vector capital in capital V. So, in that case V becomes irreducible and conversely this this happens. So, this is very simple exercise I will leave it leave it to you. So, let me now def define what is direct sum of uh, two modules. Okay. Let us say W 1 and W 2 are given G modules. So, then one can construct the direct sum of these two vector spaces. So, by definition this is just a pair some u comma v where u comes from w1 and v comes from w2. Now, what one can do? One can define the action of g okay, for any x in g. So, you define this action x acting on u comma v by just x u x v okay, for all x in w1 sorry u in w1 and v in w2. So, so then it is easy exercise to see that this indeed gives action of uh, G on W1 direct sum W2. Okay. So, it is a simple exercise to see that G acts on W1 direct sum W2 via this term. That makes W1 direct sum W2 as a G module. Okay. And this is indeed called direct sum of direct sum of W1 and W2. Okay. So, a module said to be direct sum of some finitely many modules W1 etcetera WK if it is isomorphic to W1 direct sum etcetera WK. So, now it is easy to actually generalize this notion to any finitely many direct sum. Okay. I will leave it to you. So, now one can actually uh, 
prove that uh, what we promised ok. So, let us uh, again ok. So, let us actually see some more examples uh, before getting into the proof of uh, complete reducibility characterization ok. So, here is uh, uh, some example basic example. So, one can take dou n which is the set of all upper triangular matrices the set of all ok. Let us take the diagonal matrices dou n the set of all diagonal matrices. So, naturally this is going to act ok this is sitting inside g l n of c and this is going to act on c n via matrix multiplication. So, now c n you can decompose into direct sum of c 1 etcetera c n where e 1 etcetera e n is the standard basis. Now, now it is easy to see that C e i is indeed one dimensional. So, in particularly reducible dou n module ok. So, now using our characterization you can see that C, s, C n is indeed a direct sum of uh, irreducible modules. So, that you will imply that C n is completely reducible module. So, that is also easy to check if you start with any sub module which is let us call it V so then it will have complement V does actually the natural vector space complement will will give you the complement. So, so this I will leave it as exercise now use the definition directly to prove that uh, uh, this C n is completely reducible ok C n is. So, this also implies C n is completely reducible G model ok. So, now let us actually try to understand this for just one dimensional Lie algebra. So, if we take uh, this G 1, so I guess I used A 1. So, if we take this A 1 which is spanned by let us say C x. So, this is the one dimensional uh, abelian Lie algebra. So, then if you look at its representation, so that it will be a map from A 1 to some G L of V ok. So, this is the representation. So, x is mapped to some x V. So, now there is no restriction we can choose any operator and then send it to that operator and linearly you extend then you get a representation ok because x x is 0 that is true x v x v will become 0. So, that gives you representation. So, uh, we have already understand that uh, how actually uh, isomorphic representations behave. So, if you want to actually get isomorphic representation then the corresponding uh, this uh, operator should be conjugate ok. So, let us say let us identify uh, this V with C n it is easy to work with a particular vector space n dimensional vector space. Let us say I, I have actually just mapped this x to capital X then so this is the map that is actually defines this phi x. So, then phi x isomorphic to phi y if and only if there exists g in g l n of c such that this g x g inverse becomes capital Y ok. Because as a representation g, phi x and phi y they are isomorphic. So, that means c n is isomorphic with respect to phi x ok. So, this just, just means that c n phi x this is the action that we are talking isomorphic to c n phi y. So, these two are these two modules are isomorphic if and only if. So, this happens. So, that means, uh, we know that uh, up to j l n conjugacy x can be transformed into Jordan form ok. So, that means, up to this isomorphism one can actually conjugate this x to the Jordan form of x ok. 
So, this tells that the isomorphism classes of A1 representations. So, isomorphism classes of A1 representations has one to one correspondence between the Jordan forms of uh, this n, n, n by n Jordan forms. Okay. So, now what corresponds to irreducible representation? So, it is easy to see that uh, irreducible representations must be one dimensional. So, irreducible will corresponds to one dimensional representation that means n has to be. So, this n also varies here. Okay. So, what will corresponds to completely reducible representation? So, completely reducible representation should be direct sum of irreducible representation and irreducibles are one dimensional. So, completely reducible representations will corresponds to actually vector space okay, the operator having eigens eigen basis. So, that means the operator must be diagonalizable operator. Okay, diagonalizable operator because uh, completely irreducible means it is direct sum of one dimensional. One dimensional means sorry irreducible. Irreducibles are one dimensional, so that means by collecting the vectors from non-zero vectors from that you can get a basis, eigen basis of this operator capital X, whatever that is. Okay. So, irre completely irreducible corresponds to diagonalizable operators and irreducible corresponds to one dimensional representations. So, now you can see that if you are interested in cooking up some non completely reducible representation, then you can start with some non diagonalizable operator. Okay. If I start with uh, some non diagonalizable operator uh, from uh, from this uh, GL on, GL on of C, so then you will be getting actually not completely reducible representation. So, indeed this can be used to construct a non complete reducible representation in this situation. So, let us say we have that uh, G is not equal to the derivative algebra G, G, G. Okay. So, then one can actually construct uh, the quotient the G modulo the bracket G. So, then this is indeed abelian algebra. So, now what we can do we can actually pick for example, some one dimensional quotient of this. Okay. So, pick I which is contain, contains G G that has co dimension 1 inside G. So, then we have this map G to G modulo the commutator subalgebra bracket G G derivative sub, subalgebra to G modulo i and this is going to be the one dimensional Lie algebra. Then we can actually pick some operator okay, let us say some capital X which is not diagonalizable. So, this x is mapped to this. So, then that tells you that this C n is non completely reducible module, reducible G modulo I module. So, now by pulling back, okay, pull back this. So, then that gives you non completely reducible G module. One can easily prove that uh, C n is uh, non completely reducible, G modulo I module implies G is non completely reducible, sorry, uh, C n is non completely reducible G module. So, that implies that whenever we have the situation G is not equal to the bracket G G, then we are able to get non completely reducible module for G. So, in particularly this happens when we have 
uh, G is for example soluble Lie algebra. Okay, for soluble Lie algebra, G must be not equal to GG all the time. So, what will be the other extreme? So, whenever we have G is semi simple Lie algebra, in particularly for simple Lie algebras, so we always have, okay, this is a fact. If G is semi simple, so then we have the bracket GG is equal to G. Okay. So, indeed in this situation we prove that Weyl's complete reducibility theorem. Okay. So, this is the theorem of Weyl. It says if G is finite dimensional semi simple Lie algebra, then any finite dimensional module any finite G module is completely reducible. Of course, uh, the proof of this actually like Weyl's original proof uses some analysis uh, coming from actually uh, the study of Lie groups, but here uh, we will be actually seeing uh, an algebraic proof and I will prove this result only for SLM. Okay, so we prove this for, so we prove this for only, only SLM. So I am going to prove this for SL2 first and then one can actually see how one can prove for SLM. Because to get better understanding about uh, general theory of representation, uh, one should actually see everything uh, how it goes in SL2. Okay. So, first we do it for SL2, first we do it for SL2, then later for SLM. Okay. So, I will actually stop here uh, and then we will actually continue with the uh, characterization of complete, completely reducible models in the next lecture. And then uh, we will actually move to uh, representation 3 of SL2. Thank you. I will stop here.